Okay, yeah, because um, what we're suggesting is quite a, a kind, of, kind of fairly big change from, from the norm of the way people are working, generally submitting sort of script, a single script based model. Um, we're really keen to get feedback from lots of different people uh, and make the, the paper as accessible as, as possible. So um, we'll share the link to that shortly. Um, okay, so first of all, let's imagine you're, you're building a model in, in R uh, and at its simplest, you might think of your model as just having a set of inputs that are fed into your model, your model runs, and then you return a set of results. So really like stripping back all the complexity of what we do um, to this one really basic concept. Now, if you would want to build a model in R um, for this, you know, this example here is the healthy sicker model from DAF, you might structure that model something like this in terms of your uh, file structure and the way that it works. So you might have a load of user inputs stored somewhere with the default default stored somewhere. You might have some raw data, might be patient level data, might be something else, uh, costing data, utility data. And then you'd have a series of functions or scripts. So you should have a series of functions or scripts that are stored somewhere in your, your file structure. And then your model is essentially just a series of uh, functions which are um, both sequential. So for example, function one leads into function two, but then um, also maybe nested. So you might have a series of nested functions like function three and four, which, sit, which are called by function two. Um, and so all of these functions combined lead to some set of results and potentially from then on some visuals and tables. And then those are output. So, um, so our model is kind of constructed of this data and then our code, our set of, of functions and scripts. And so by the time we've done this in R with our documentation of our functions and, and our data, uh, our file structure might look like this. So we might have a folder that contains raw data and some default inputs. We might have a folder that contains all of our model functions a folder that contains all of our documentation, a folder that contains some tests to make sure our functions are operating as we expect, as we develop our, our model, and we don't break something inadvertently as we're working. And then we might have a folder that contains outputs. And the reason why that's in the dotted line is that to, to get those outputs, you can always run the model. So you don't necessarily have to have that kind of sent to something. So there's kind of a, an optional extra, I guess, to, to have the outputs actually in your, in your code base. And by the time you've done this, you essentially have um, a package already. Like you're so close to a package at this stage um, that you may as well just structure it like this. Well, this would be my argument anyway. And so in a package structure, you have your package top level um, folder. You have a description of the package. Uh, that's one file, a namespace file. Your R folder, which contains all your functions. Uh, a man folder, so essentially a manual folder. Um, which contains the documentation of each function, a data folder which contains raw data and would, um, I would argue in this case, would contain also your default values um, that users might want to change, and a uh, vignette folder which might contain documentation of the higher level structure of the model. So your man folder might document what each function is doing, but then your, your vignette folder would be a, a broader kind of higher level this is what I'm trying to achieve by putting all these functions together. So essentially your, your model documentation. And then a test folder containing tests. And so there's a, a really nice book and Zach gave a really nice talk uh, yesterday on how to kind of start constructing these packages. And so we've written this, uh, this paper kind of guiding the user through a simple healthy connect model uh, example, which has one function, calculate ISA, take some inputs, um, and we hope that that's kind of a useful addition to this R packages to make this R packages book very uh, health economics relevant. So the benefits of this is that every package, when, when you pick one up, when you are re reviewing one, everyone will have a very similar structure. So it kind of improves familiarity between modelers with these, um, with these different models. Documentation is done by default and uh, well, I'll show a bit later um, how, the, how this works. And we saw a little bit of that yesterday with the help files. But because of the way uh, packages work, you can check that your package meets certain criteria. And one of those criteria is that it's documented. So it kind of enforces good coding behavior uh, through the use of, of Roxy. It also enforces this through unit testing, which is tests on specific subfunctions. So um, we can ensure that, it, and it gives the modeler some confidence that as they're developing their model, 
they're not breaking things um, that they, they previously built. And potentially more important from the perspective of those um, who are listening who are kind of from a regulatory background, so NICE, ZIN, CADS, others, um, it allows reviewers to test the tests rather than going into the equivalent of every single cell to make sure it's doing what it's doing. So what I mean by that is, has the, the modeler who submitted this model perform the necessary tests on each of their functions to make sure that function is doing what it's doing and are we confident in it? And so it might be that where they've constructed that function themselves, they need to prove through the use of ex extensive testing that they've written that that function is doing the right thing. But if they've used somebody else's function, so potentially functions from survey G or others, then they can rely on the testing that's already been done by the author of that function and the kind of um, validation and, and a confidence of the wider community. So we hope that that will speed up model review. And the last benefit, which I'm gonna, gonna talk about in much more detail now, is that once you've developed your model in, in this way, split it up into, into small kind of units, it's much more easy to distribute, to share code with others and for others to, to build upon what you've done. So uh, therefore we don't have to kind of continuous, continuously reinvent wheels, and we've got kind of a standard method that's easy to review and share. So you might think the first person to build a model in R on a specific topic would have to do a lot from scratch. They'd be writing a lot of their own code. If they then share that, say on, on GitHub, for example, as a package, the second person building that model has to write slightly less code. There'll be some functions that they can reuse because a lot of what we do is, is bespoke and custom, but a lot of what we do is also um, quite standard, some of the methods that we use. And then person three can borrow stuff from model one, model two, and so on and so on. And so eventually we're kind of sharing more and more of these kind of subunits, the function, which then gradually over time means that each person is, is making slightly less of their own code. And we see this already to a large extent from people who are using subfunctions from survey G or FlexServe or whatever packages exist right now. But by kind of encouraging people to build their model as a package, we're just kind of extending that uh, to a much broader, broader scale. And so I guess my main argument is that we don't, you don't have to, when you're building your, your model, think of it as I'm going to build this one size fits all amazing thing like HeSIM or HeMod. There will be sub functions, small units of pieces of work calculations that you've done that other people will find useful. And so it's worth wrapping that into a package because it's just not really that much work um, once you're already building a model kind of in, a, in good practice anyway. So um, the question we got kind of internally was, but won't we end up having to install a large number of packages? Because if every model is going to be built as a package and then we want to use one function from each model, aren't we going to have a, a huge number of packages being installed just to get one or two functions from each? So just like when you order something from Amazon, you get a huge box, tiny little object. Uh, that's cool. Um, so then there's the potential for industry, academia, consulting funded project to collate package code, the, use, the really useful functions that we think can be used a lot from these different models and build it into a kind of regulated preferred, and this is a very contentious word, um, we talked about validate package code, regulator approved. We weren't really quite sure on the, the wording here. It's a bit controversial. But what we're trying to get across is that once the community is happy with this package, that it does that, that those, those units do what they, they say they're doing, there would be a lot more confidence from those reviewing the model. So they might give it a, that function a light touch with you. It's more a case of, is this being used correctly rather than is the calculation correct? And the example I gave yesterday is nobody's reviewing the, the base R mean function. If you review a model in R, you're not saying is the underlying code for the mean function correct. People just kind of take it as given that that calculation is done correctly. And so then others, so for model 789, could use the tend to prioritize that package. And again, we see this already with, with ServHE and, and FlexServe and others, um, but it's kind of the argument here is that if we are building our models packages, we can start to develop kind of a circular iterative system where we're gradually incrementally improving these um, uh, 
this 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 package and that's growing over time and it might be there's a kind of it's not one package it's topic related there's a few related packages which everybody's kind of contributing contributing to and over time we're, we're improving our code base and so yeah we have an iterative process here and so the question is who is the best place to do this piece of work of iteratively improving and i'd argue this community is kind of best place to do that or at least kind of various people within this community leading a group of open source uh, collaboration um, kind of organizing this but not necessarily doing it and it could be sort of an open source pro process where we're sort of all reviewing each other's work and gaining confidence in, in each other's work so overall um, our packages can serve as sort of templates for best practice making it easier to review and distribute code but the crucial thing here is, is confidence, is getting people confident both using these packages, but also confidence in the individual functions uh, of the packages themselves. And the benefits are enormous in terms of efficiency, not having everybody reinvent wheels, um, and therefore kind of standardizing best practice and disseminating best practice. And for the individual researchers involved, the kind of attribution in terms of citations of these packages, is obviously beneficial for their profile. So in theory, it should work. So there's some previous examples of this. So for example, um, Fernando's paper uh, on biomarker testing uh, was constructed as a, as a package. And the DARS group have a kind of template package already created, uh, which is a really good, good guide. And that's um, kind of part of, of Fernando's um, kind of coding framework paper as well. It's described there. Uh, so I'd really recommend people take a look at that. But we've kind of written another parallel paper uh, referencing that one, uh, kind of guiding users kind of through the more basic process rather than using a template from somebody else of just building the package kind of from scratch for their model. So rather than taking the template from, from DART, which I think is, is fantastic and is one way of achieving this, this aim, is just to, to go ahead and, and start building these packages for your models uh, yourself. So we guide the reader um, and we'll share the, the Google Doc link, essentially from the basics of, I have one function that runs a very, very simple model, how do I build that into a package? So we hope that that is a kind of a useful next step. Uh, and we really encourage people who think it sucks to let us know why, uh, and we'll try and improve it. Um, and if you want to be a co-author, you think you want to write a substantial piece on it, then, then more than merry. So in that paper, we go through uh, creating what we call Hecon pack, um, which contains a single function, um, CalGeyser. We show how to document it, uh, how to run checks on it, correct, talk about licensing. And at each stage of this, we link through to other resources for kind of finding out more how to do this. Um, we show how to create the description file of your package, how to run tests on that, that function, what to do with internal and external data, uh, and how to write your kind of vignette. And the example for this is, is made open source um, at Hecompack, um, our package. Uh, and we so we also so we show this tutorial paper with the Hecompack package showing how to build that from scratch. But we also built as a case study the six sicker model into a, a package um, showing how to kind of split the code from the data and hosting the the parameter inputs on a remote server. And so I'm going to hand over to, to Well, who's going to talk to you about that package and show a little bit of code. Thank you, Rob. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Weil, and uh, obviously I'm very delighted today to talk to you about our uh, case study, the Six Sigma Pack. And as just uh, Rob said, the Six Sigma Pack is a, a a, an R package that we created as a case study in which we transformed a script-based model into a, a package-based model. And the idea was we we, we wanted to use a, a, an existing uh, model that everyone, or almost uh, uh, most people would know about and switch it from a script-based model into an R package model to let people know the advantages of, of having uh, such a, uh, of ha have, having a model in, in a package. So currently the package is, is hosted on, on GitHub and it's under the subdomain of the, uh, the Dark Peaks Analytics. Now to say, you see that it's, it's under the Dark Peaks 
But before we move on to the packet itself, let's remember for those who have seen or have heard about the Six Sigma model before, how the script-based uh, uh, version of the model looks like. And this, this version of the script, uh, this version of the model was published before by uh, Eline uh, Kriekamp, sorry if I'm pronouncing the, uh, the name incorrectly, and her colleagues in 2018. And the, the, the script starts with the, uh, well, with some user inputs, as you can see there, uh, probability, uh, the transition probabilities from, from some health states, cost call is, uh, sorry, cost and utilities associated with each of the health states of the Markov model. And for those who didn't hear about the, the Six Sigma model before, it's a four state Markov model where, uh, that is simulating a, a hypothetical disease with two levels of illness, sick and sicker, hence the sick sicker name. So the, 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 the script then moves on into defining a, a, a function. That function simply uh, manipulates some of the transition probabilities, constructs a, a transition probability matrix, uh, then uh, uh, defines or creates or constructs a, 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 a mark of trace and then uses that mark of trace in order to estimate the, the, the cost effectiveness outcomes, in this case, the costs and the qualities. And the script ends, as you say, that you see down there by printing the, the results in, in, in form of a talk of, of the table. And obviously to run the model, you will simply source or execute the entire file so that it, it runs the model for you. So what we did was we, we used this diagram to explain what it did. And we essentially introduced two main functions, the run PSA, and the run six sigma model. And as the name suggests, the run six sigma model is the function that essentially runs the model for you. And it does so by using a set of user inputs and by calling other sub functions, namely the defined transition matrix, which as the script based model does, it, it defined transition matrix passes it through to the create uh, a Markov trace, which creates a Markov trace. And then to, together with the cost, uh, calculate costs and calculate qualities, they do uh, generate or calculate the, the, the cost effectiveness uh, results. The other uh, main function we, added, uh, we, we, we introduced was the run PSA, which is rather a wrapper or a generic function that takes in any model. Uh, it it uh, prepares or generates probabilistic sensitivity analysis parameter configurations and then calls in the run uh, six sigma model in order to evaluate those parameter configurations. Now, after, after, after finishing uh, the, 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 the run PSA uh, produces results or stores results in a form of a table, which is then further uh, processed by a, an interface function, so which is called the plot PSA, which, which essentially transforms the, the outputs from the run PSA model into outputs that are suitable for consumption by a different function from a different package, which is called the Bayesian cost effectiveness uh, analysis function by Chen Luca. Uh, and, and, and then it spits out the, the figures and, and tables, cost effectiveness, uh, PSA results. Now, I'll, I'll say one more thing before we move into seeing how, the, how, how we can install the package and then run the functions, is that both the main, both main functions, the run PSA and the run six sigma models, do use either locally stored data or uh, remotely securely stored data. And they do so by utilizing a helper function that we introduced, which is called the get model params function. And the, uh, and, and, and the, the get model params function is, is, is usually called internally by both functions if the user supplies the essential uh, uh, source URL, which is the address of the API in which the data is stored, and any required credentials or, or passwords to access that data. Now, to quickly show you, well, obviously I didn't have the courage to do this in front of you here, and I was worried about any technical hiccups, so I installed it uh, in a recorded it in a in a GIF. So the first thing that we need to do is to use the uh, the install GitHub uh, function from the DevTools package, and we give it the the package URL, and it, it downloads the package, and it, then R will come back to you say saying that there is this these number of packages that you may like to update. If you wanted to, it will update it for you. Otherwise, it will just go on and install the package for you. Then I will quickly show you that we've included dummy data 
And then the, the whole purpose of the dummy data, which is documented, as you can see here with the HAL file, is to allow users to test the functions and to uh, and, and to review it if they would like to. And then the run PS, the run uh, six sigma model function, as you can see, it's documented with the help file. It, it tells you what a parameter it expects, the, the, the arguments that it can take, and we've included help, uh, included examples of how to use the function. You can see that it's being used by the W data that's available. And you can see here in the other, in the second example of some the second set of code, it's it's be, it's going to call an API with the password and the username, and it it it, it successfully uh, runs the model using uh, remote stored data. And you can see that there are differences between the costs calculated by dummy data and remote stored data. We can also look at the run PSA function. And again, the run PSA function has, again, we've also included some dummy data for PSA uh, parameter uh, uh, information of parameter distributions. Uh, this is the documented data. And you can see again, the run PSA is also well documented. It will tell you the parameters it needs. And again, we have example code within the package. Uh, you can use it. You can, you can test the function using uh, the locally stored dummy data. As you can see there, and we are going to call it for only two simulations or two PSA runs, and then it does it. And again, as I said earlier, using the get model params function, it will call it internally and it will pass the name of the uh, or the, the address of the API together with the the user or the path and the password, and it will it will do that for us. It will grab the PSA data and run the PSA locally. Great. So one last thing that I would like to highlight here and, uh, and to emphasize uh, the point which Rob earlier uh, mentioned is that we, 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 would, we would like to recycle the code. So we, we built the, the, the functions in a way that we, that we can use in future projects. And that's why all the functions except one in this package are reusable and they are generic. So the only package, the only function that is not reusable in, in other, in, 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 for other models is the run six model. It's specific to the runs to the to the six sigma model. It has some features in it. Uh, but the other functions, all the functions that are highlighted in red are generic and they can be used in other functions uh, in, 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 in writing other models. In. And just to give you a, a, a trivial example, I've used the, the, the define transition matrix function here uh, in order to uh, just to, 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 to plot the, the diagram of, of, of a model. Uh, I, I'm passing it to the plot mat function from the diagram. And they got it. We have a different uh, structure for a different map of model. So if you're interested in the package, but we obviously want you to go and play around with it. Uh, the link is there. It's the third from the bottom. And it's under the dark peak subdomain in GitHub. Thank you. I'm just sharing the link to the package and okay. So the link to the package is in the for the waiting room participants, you better, better talk ah. to, to everyone. Just on the for... on the menu there, to to everyone. Ah, to okay. everyone. Thank you. Uh, so the package is there, and the uh, paper link I put on LinkedIn, and now I can't remember where it is. Copy. <laughs> so the paper that we really like feedback on is also linked to. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And you know, talk all. <laughs> take questions if it's problematic. Exactly. Yeah. Any questions for Rob? And call it quite fine. From the room, you can be the first one to use this. Um, hi, I'm Nicola. Um, thanks for that. Uh, really interesting thought. Um, I'm just wondering if, aside from the kind of confidence and testing of the functions, like what you think the main other benefits are from kind of turning a, a kind of standard script into a package um, and also are there maybe some negatives in that 
I'm just speaking from my own experience, if I'm copying someone's kind of script code, I tend to understand a bit more what's going like on in that function. Whereas I guess there's a bit of a risk with a package that becomes a bit more of a black box and yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. So I think other benefits, I suppose, um, once you have a package, it's kind of a self-contained um, well, package of functions. And so, for example, things like if you wanted to build a, a, a Shiny app, you can just call in the whole package and then you have all the functions you need for your Shiny app. And so you kind of, you've got one unit of one code base that's in one location that you can guarantee every time you call, if you install it and then call the functions, um, they're going to be the same. So you could have an application and a automated report and a uh, script that all called the same functions and you weren't kind of um, copy and pasting them between. Uh, in terms of downsides, um, I suppose, I guess, I guess there's this, the overhead in terms of it's a new thing to learn. Um, people can be put off by the fact that you're kind of continually testing. So as you write your, as you write a script, you might just continue to write code, whereas in a package you tend to write code and then hit the test function and all the tests will rerun. And so that can be a bit off-putting when you're kind of starting uh, again. Um, but yeah, other than that, do you know of any other downsides? No, I think that's the only downside that I would think about. But I think some of the benefits are the benefits is that you can improve your functions from time to time, as in improve the efficiency of, of, of the functions and then make sure that while you improve the efficiency, you haven't broken them, as in improve in, in, in uh, uh, introduced an, a silent error into the into the functions. And this is guaranteed to some extent by the, by the tests you've, you've introduced when you started uh, writing your functions. I think there's another, there's another one there. So I think there's two questions. On okay, so then we move on to the online ones. Go for it. Yeah. Actually, just to follow up on that one, I would say there's a there's a couple of your questions that maybe weren't addressed. Um, there is no reason why you can't read the code. If you've gone from GitHub, the code is right there, just the eye, you can go in and read it. Um, and the other big advantage of packages is reproducible research. It's there, anybody can install it, particularly if you add on information about the um, like the environment that you built it in and that kind of thing, or you containerize it, then it's really simple. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I containerizing is, is a whole other topic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, containerizing is a whole other topic, but yeah, but certainly huge benefit there. Um, probably further down the line for our industry, given that we're trying to get people to move from Excel, but yeah. Oh, right, shall we move on to the online questions? I think that's that one. There's one on Q&A and then one on the ah, right. So on the last example with a transition matrix, if I have larger model with more else states and cycle specific transition probabilities, how would I go about reusing that transition matrix function? Okay, so the transition, the, the defined transition matrix function that we've uh, defined or the, uh, introduced in this package is valid for any Markov model that is, does not relax the Markovian assumption, as in it, it uses uh, uh, static probability, transition probability uh, matrix, it, where, where the transition probability matrix doesn't change. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it's not affected by the number of health states. If 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 I got the question correct. Do you want to read the, the Q and A chat so we can read it? All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, the Cran question is so. So the question is, do you see any advantages to uploading a package to Cran versus just hosting on GitHub? So we've suggested just hosting on GitHub, and we've had this question from a few different people now at various talks. Um, and so I've not submitted anything to Cran. Um, my impression is that there's a lot of extra time spent to make sure that it's kind of compliant for all the different reasons. Uh, that are really important for kind of software development. The reason why we've kind of promoted posting these on GitHub is that the key aim of this is just to provide a code open source to be able to build on. And so it's kind of a collaborative thing rather than necessarily really reliable software. So you can go and take the functions from a package. And as long as we kind of all have confidence in them, it's fine on GitHub. Does it need to go to cram? There's quite a lot of work involved in that. And would somebody do that if they're quite short on time? Probably not. So, yeah. I'm just wondering, maybe Chris Jackson, do you want to comment on this? The developer of Plexus. Um, 
Grant versus Skip will be mean. Yeah, for, for each individual, so if you like, if you had ten different modelers working on ten different models, would all of them want to submit that to CRAN, or is GitHub enough? Well, I mean, it depends on whether I think whether the the, the package is stable and whether you're continually changing it. Um, if it's a you know, if it's a self-contained piece of work that you're wanting to stick around for a few years and just do the same thing in the same way, um, then. GitHub might be better, but Cron is, I think it's more, it, it's, it gives it gives users confidence that it's been tested, validated, and it's, it's, it's a, all, all those checks are a bit of, a, those checks that you have to go through, they're a bit of a faff, but it's, it's good for the users in terms of quality, quality control, it's, it gives them a reassurance that it's been through this process of quality control, and, that, and I think that's more beneficial if it's this, intended as a stable piece of software. But if it's an ongoing development process, if you're trying to refine, and you, you, I guess you, your end goal of, of an RHTA thing for regulators, if that's your end point, if that's going to be your stable thing that you're aiming towards, then yeah, it might be a good goal to get on CRAN eventually, I think. That, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think, I think the CRAN checks are nothing to do with health economics. The CRAN checks are just software checks. So just because something's on CRAN, you could publish something incredibly basic and completely wrong in terms of health economics on CRAN, but it would pass all the CRAN checks, right? Whereas, yeah, the but review... Still value that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. But I guess the peer review yeah. process from a health economist is what's really valuable, and you can do that on CRAN or GitHub. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> Excellent discussion. I think we should move on to the next um, question. Thank you.